Yes. The Secret of Platform 13, Chapter 15. The getaway van was parked in the narrow road which ran between the back of the Astor and the river. It had been dark for some time. The passing boats had lit their lamps and lights streamed from the windows of the hotel. The inside of the van was piled with blankets so that the prince could be made comfortable on the way to the Gump. All the rescuers' belongings were there because they were driving straight to the station. An Odge's suitcase was there, carefully lay flat. The door of the van was open and plenty of fresh air reached the mistmaker through the holes that Odge had drilled in it, so he should have been content, but he was not. He was too old for suitcases, he was a free spirit, he was used now to being part of things. Rustling about in the hay, complaining in little whimpers, he put his sharp front teeth against the fibre of the case and found a weak place where the rim round one of the holes had frayed. Getting interested, beginning to see hope, he began to gnaw. The driver noticed nothing. He had his eyes fixed on the boy who crouched on top of the fire escape. As soon as Ben signalled with his torch, he'd back up against the entrance. In the dining room of the Astor, the guests waited for the cake. The orchestra played a tango. It's awfully hot in here, complained a girl at one of the tables and called a waiter. The mist maker went on gnawing. He was pleased. Something was happening. The hole was getting bigger and bigger and bigger still. His whiskers were already through and his nose they quite suddenly would be free. Trembling with excitement, he sat up on his haunches and looked about him. And at that moment, one of the waiters opened a window in the dining room, sending the sound of the orchestra out into the night. Music! And what music? The mist maker had never heard a full orchestra in his life. His eyes grew huge, his moustache quivered. Then, with a bound, he leapt out of the van and set off. The driver's eyes were still on Ben. Lolloping along like a lovesick pillow, the mist maker crossed the road, leapt onto the bottom rung of the fire escape, missed, tried again. Now he was on and was climbing steadily. Um pa pa, um pa pa went the band. The violin soared, the saxophone throbbed. Ben peered down the iron stairs, wondering if he had something white crossing the road. No, he must have been mistaken. The Astor was beside the river, and the river bank was full of rats, large, intelligent rats who had dug paths for themselves into the hotel. Panting up the first rung of the fire escape, the mist maker found a hole in the brick and plunged into it. It came out near the kitchens, behind a store cupboard, and from there another rat run led into the pantry where the waiter set out the trays to carry into the dining room. He only had to cross a passage, run through an open door, and now he was where he wanted to be, where he absolutely had to be, facing that wonderful sound. He had arrived just as the cake was wheeled away and the room was in darkness. But that didn't matter because the band was still playing and it was a V&S waltz. The mist maker made his way into the middle of the room and sat down. Never, never had he heard anything so beautiful. The fur on the back of his neck lifted. He shivered with happiness. His earlobe throbbed. <sighs> Sighed the mist maker. <sighs> the waves of mist were slight to begin with. He was puffed from the climb and he was overwhelmed. But as the beauty of the music sank deeper and deeper into his soul, so did the clouds of whiteness that came from him. At one of the tables, an old gentleman began to cough. An angry lady leapt across her husband and told the man at the next table to stop smoking. I'm not smoking, the man said crossly. But as the lights came on again, the guests could see that something odd was happening. The room was covered in a thick white mist so thick that the trottle's table could hardly be seen. It's smoke. The room's full of smoke, shouted a girl in a glittery dress. No, it isn't. It's tear gas, yelled a bold man and put his napkin to his face. It's a terrorist bomb, cried a fat lady. Bruce was blundering around Main Raymond's chair, feeling for the boy. Perhaps he was hiding under the table, trying to get away from the creeping gas. Clutching his gun, he dived under the cloth. The mist maker was upset by the ugly shrieking. He moved closer to the band, which was still playing. A good orchestra will play through thick and thin. Once more, he gave himself up to the beauty of the music. Once more, he sighed, but he was getting thinner now. He was no longer pillow-shaped. The whiteness that came from him was not so thick. And in, a, and in a break in the mist, a woman in a trouser suit stood and pointed. Look, it's coming from that horrible thing, she screeched. It's a poisonous rat. It's a rodent from out of space. It's got the plague. They do that. They give off fumes and then they go mad and bite you. The cries came from all over the room. 
a way to rust in with a fire extinguisher and squirted foam all over a group of Arabs in their splendid robes. One of the Astor's own guards had seized a walking stick and was banging it on the floor. And now something happened which put the mismaker's life in mortal danger. The band gave up. The music stopped. And with it, the supply of mist which had helped to hide and shelter him. Suddenly, cut off from the glorious sound, the little animal blinked and tried to come back to the real world. Then he began to run, hither and thither, looking for the way back. And Doreen Trout reached for her knitting bag. In the artist's dressing room, Gurky had climbed out of the cake. She had a bruise on her shoulder where Raymond's chin had hit her, but she was being brave. The prince looked crumpled, but his breathing was steady. Only a few minutes now and he'd be stretched out in the van where she could make him comfortable. I bopped him well, asked Hans, who had followed her from the dressing room. You bopped beautifully, said Gurky. The troll came out of the toilet and opened the double bass case. I'll take the feet, he said, and Hans nodded and went to <coughs> Raymond's shoulder. Everything was going according to plan. It was at that moment that the door to the fire escape burst open and Ben, ashen-faced and frantic, rushed into the room. The Miss Maker's escaped, he said. He's in the dining room and they're going mad in there. They'll kill him. No. Hans let go of Raymond, who fell back to the cake. One duty, our duty, is to the prince. You must not, you must go. Ben did not even hear him. Before the ogre could move to stop him, he'd reached the other door and was gone. In the dining room, everyone was shrieking and joining in the hunt for the dangerous rodent from outer space. The Arabs, whose robes had been squirted with foam, were yelling at the waiter. A lady had fainted and fallen into the apple pie. There he is, screamed a woman behind the trolley. And Bruce aimed, fired, and hit a bottle of champagne which exploded in smithereens. The mist maker was terrified now. The shrieks and thumps beat on his ears like hammer blows. His head was spinning and he ran in circles trying to find the way out. He's got rabies, yelled a woman. That's how you tell when they go round and round like that. If he bites you, you're finished, shouted a red-faced man. Get on the table, he'll get your ankles. The lady did just that and the table broke, sending her crashing to the ground. Don't let him get me, she screamed. Squash him, finish him. Bruce had seized the chair and was holding it above his head as he stalked the desperate little beast. Now he brought it down with a thump and one leg came off and rolled away. He'd missed, moaned the woman on the floor. Once again, Bruce raised the chair. Once again, he brought it down and once again, he missed. Doreen Trout had not screamed. She had not thumped. She had not picked up heavy chairs or reached for her gun. All she had done was take out her favorite knitting needles. It was a sock needle of the finest steel and sharper than any dagger. She had judged its length and it would skewer the animal neatly without any waste. Get out of the way, oaf, she hissed at her brother. I'm dealing with this. Just corner him. This was easier said than done. The mist maker, caught in the nightmare, scuttled between the tables, vanished into patches of whiteness, skittered on the foam, but his enemies were gathering. The saxophone player had jumped down from the bandstand and shooed him against the wall. A waiter with a broom handle blocked him as he tried to dive behind the curtains, and now he was cornered his eyes huge with fear. He sat trembling and waiting for what was to come. Stand back, said Doreen to the crowd and began to move slowly towards the terrified animal. Come on, my pretty, she cooed. Come to your mummy, come and see what I've got for you. The room fell silent. Everyone was watching Doreen Trout holding her needle as she moved closer and all the time talking in a coaxing, wheedling voice. The mist maker's whiskers twitched, he blinked delicate ears became flushed. Here was a low voice, a kind voice. He turned his head this way and that, listening. I've got lovely things for you in my bag. Carrots, lettuce. More than anything, the desperate creature wanted kindness. Should he risk it? He took a few steps towards her, paused, sat upon his haunches. Then suddenly he made up his mind and in a movement of trust he turned over on his back with his paws in the air as he had done so often when he was playing with Ben and Odge. He knew what would come next. That moment they scratched him so soothingly and deliciously all down his front. Soft parts, Doreen looked down at the rounded unprotected stomach of the little beast, at the pink skin still showing where his grown up fur had not yet come. Then she smiled and raised her arm. The next second the she lay sprawled on the floor. A boy had come from nowhere and leapt at her, fastening his arms around her throat. 
You murderous! I'll kill you, I'll kill you if you harm him! shouted Ben. The attack was so sudden that Doreen dropped her needle, which quivered point down in the carpet. Scratching and spitting, she tried to shake Ben off with her free hand crawled like a spider towards the embedded needle. Get the boy idiot, she spluttered at Bruce. Bruce. But that was easier said than done. Every time it looked as though he could get a shot at Ben, some bit of Doreen got in the way. Anyway, his sister was so sure to win, the boy fought like a maniac, but he was half her size, and her hand was almost on the needle. Now she was clawing at his face, and he pushed her away and tried to free himself. His arm was clear of Doreen's body. Blowing a hole in the boy's arm was better than nothing, and carefully Bruce lifted his gun and aimed. The next second he staggered back, reeling, while pieces of splintered wood rained down on his shoulders. The double bass player had gone mad and hit him on the head with his instrument, except that the real double bass player was up on the bandstand with his hand to his mouth, staring down at the man who seemed to be him. But Doreen's crawling fingers had reached the needle, pulled it out, holding the glittering steel above Ben's throat. She brought it down in a single violent thrust, just as Ben, with a superhuman effort, rolled out of her grasp. Ow! Help! Help! Bruce clutched his foot, hopped, tried to pull the needle out of his shoe. Maddened by pain, half stunned by the blow of the troll had given him, he seized a brass table lamp. Ben had turned, trying to catch the mistmaker. He had no time to dodge, no time to save himself. The base of the heavy lamp came down on his skull in a single crashing blow, and as the blood gushed from the wound, he fell unconscious to the ground. He's dead, screamed a woman. I hope so, said Dorian softly. But if not, she pulled the needle out of her brother's shoe and knelt down beside Ben, searching for the soft hollow beneath his ear. But then something terrifying happened. As she bent over the boy, she was suddenly pushed back, as if by an invisible hand. Pushed back so hard that she fell against the plate glass window, which broke with a crash. It was incredible, but they could all see it. Slowly, gently, the wounded boy rose into the air. Higher he rose, and higher, blood still trickled from his scalp. He lay with one arm dangling from his head, thrown back. Lay in the air, unsupported and clearly visible above the mist. He's going to heaven, cried someone. He's been called up to paradise. And that was how it looked to everyone there. They had seen pictures of saints and martyrs who could do that, levitate or lift themselves up and lie there in the clouds. But that wasn't the end of it. Now the boy, who had to be dead, began to float slowly, gently away, high over everyone's head, until he vanished through the door.